Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Blake and I'm going to be teaching you about structural geology. So before I get down and dirty and talk about the actual contents of the class, let me go ahead and just t uh, tell you a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about. Structural geology is divided into a two-part class mostly. You've got a lab portion and you've got a lecture portion. The content of this particular web series is going to be largely on the lab portion of the material. This is going to cover real-world applications of what you can do in the field, as well as mathematical operations and things of this sort. The lecture part of this class largely deals with the basic concepts and the understanding of what goes on behind the scenes. Additionally, it has a lot more vocabulary and things associated with that. So let's just go ahead and get started, shall we? In this particular episode, I'd like to talk about the orientation of lines and planes in space. Now, if you've ever had a linear algebra course or a calculus three course, then you're probably already familiar with trying to represent lines and planes in space. Um, in geology, however, we tend to do things a bit differently. So in mathematics, we tend to use equations to try and represent lines and planes in space. However, in geology, we're not so mathematically inclined. Instead, we choose to, uh, to use things like strike and dip to represent a plane, and then we use trend and plunge to represent a line. So before I get into that sort of thing, let me just go ahead and talk to you about compass directions. So we're all pretty familiar with the standard compass um, that we all know and love. We've got north, east, south, and west on our compass here. Now there's two different ways of representing a compass. There's azimuth and then there's quadrant. Um, in geology, most people tend to use azimuth directions, but I'm just going to go ahead and teach you about both real quick. So azimuth directions, first and foremost, we recognize that every direction around this compass has three numbers, and this is done to help uh, alleviate some sort of ambiguity later on. Um, if we want to represent due north, we simply say 0, 0, 0. And then technically we put a degree sign, but I just omitted that here. If we want to represent any other direction, we move clockwise around the circle. And until we get back to 359 degrees, we just continue increasing. There's nothing too special about this particular method. It's just easier. Um, it's, it's a pretty simple idea of how to represent compass directions. If we want to represent due east, we say 0, 9, 0. Due south is 180, due west is 270. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the quadrant method. The basic idea behind the quadrant method is that we are going to use our own knowledge of what north, northeast, southwest, all those different cardinal and subcardinal directions actually mean. So if you can see my handwriting here, if we want to represent due north, what we can say is just simply due north. Some people will represent this a little bit differently, but I feel like this is probably the easiest way. And there are four different quadrants here. We've got the northeastern quadrant, we've got the southeastern quadrant, we've got the southwestern quadrant, and we've got the northwestern quadrant. And each one of these quadrants is going to be important because if we want to represent a particular angle within those quadrants, we're going to need, need to know which quadrant we're in. So I've represented four different particular diagonal angles here, and these are all going to be the basic idea of what we're going to be doing. So if we want to re represent 45 degrees, like we've done over here, instead of just saying 045, what we're going to do is we're first going to look at either the north direction or the south direction, and then head either east or west from that direction to figure out how far away we are. So if I want to represent 45 degrees east of north, then what I can do is I can start at north, I will head 45 degrees towards the east, and then I've met my angle. And the way that I say this particular thing is north 45 degrees east. And then if I want to represent a slightly larger angle, I could say north 50 degrees east, and etc. Um, whenever we get to due east, this can be represented with two angles. We could say north 90 degrees east, or south 90 degrees east. Alternatively, it might even be easier just to say due east. The same thing goes for the western angles. If I want to go um, 
in this case 225 degrees, what I can instead do is I could say south 45 degrees west. And this will also give me the same angle. And just like with the eastern direction, the western direction can be represented two different ways, north 90 degrees west or south 90 degrees west. Um, for the most part, as I've already said, most people choose to use azimuth because whenever they're entering in computer programs, it's a lot easier to just type in three numbers and not have to worry about accidentally typing um, north instead of south or something as simple as that. So the three numbers is generally easier. It's generally the one that's used more, but throughout the course of this show, I may be switching between azimuth and quadrant just to try and keep you on your feet. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and do a couple practice problems. I'm going to ask you to convert the following into the opposite form. So I'm going to first of all give you some quadrant directions, and I'm going to ask you to convert them to the azimuth method. So we've got north 37 degrees east and south 50 degrees west. So go ahead and pause the video if you need, take a couple seconds to try and figure out what these would look like in the azimuth method. Alright, so here are our answers. North 37 degrees east simply translates to 037 degrees, and then south 50 degrees west translates to 230 degrees. So if we think about this, if we first of all look at north 37 degrees east, I would start at north and I would head 37 degrees east and then I would land about here. If I look at this same angle over on the azimuth compass, this is going to be about 037. Whenever I look at south 50 degrees west, I start at south, I head 50 degrees west, I end up right about here, and then if I look over here on this compass, this is going to be 230 degrees. Alright, now let's go ahead and take a look at the opposite way around. I'm going to give you two azimuth coordinates, and I'm going to ask you to convert these to quadrant coordinates. Alright, so the first one is 095, and the second one is 325. All right, so go ahead and pause the video and try to convert these to quadrant. Okay, the answers for this one, we have south 85 degrees east and north 35 degrees west. Now if you haven't got this, go ahead and try and take a look at these two compasses again. Try and figure out where your mistake was. If you need to, go back, rewind the video, and um, work again. But as long as you got this down, you've got the basic idea behind the compass. So let's go ahead and move on to the next part. Next I'd like to talk to you specifically about lines and planes in space. So first we're just going to be talking about planes. If you take a look at this first picture, what you're going to recognize is you're going to have this horizontal plane here, and it's intersected by this diagonal plane that is uh, green. So we are trying to analyze this particular green plane. We're trying to figure out what is its orientation in space. Geologists use strike and dip in order to figure out what these things are. So the strike is going to be a horizontal line that occurs at the intersection of the horizontal plane and the plane of interest. In this case, this is the red line. And so the direction that this red line heads, north, east, south, west, or any direction in between, is going to be the strike of this plane. So in this particular example, this goes due north because you can see this red line is heading in the northern direction. But what we can also tell is that it's also heading in the southern direction, right? 
because it's a line. It extends in both directions. So it extends both due north and due south. Um, in geology, we tend to use this thing called the right-hand rule. So basically what the right-hand rule says is if you point your thumb in the direction of the strike, your index finger will point in the direction of the dip. The dip is going to be the downslope direction. So if you can imagine yourself pointing in the direction that this plane dips, then you are going to um, then recognize that your thumb has to point north. Another way to think about this is that the dip angle is going to be 90, or sorry, the dip direction is going to be 90 degrees clockwise from the strike. So if I have the strike at due north, then the dip direction has to be 90 degrees clockwise of that, which is going to be exactly due east, or in this case, 090. All right, and so the dip angle in this particular example is approximately 60 degrees because the dip angle is determined by the angle between the horizontal plane and the plane of interest. And in this case, it is 60 degrees right about there. Most geologists don't make a determination between the dip direction and the dip angle. They simply will say dip and expect you to recognize that the dip direction is going to be uh, exactly 90 degrees clockwise of the strike. And that's something that should be inferred based off the information that's given. In this particular episode, I'm only making the distinction so you recognize that the dip direction is the one that goes down slope. The dip angle is the angle from the horizontal plane, and the strike is the horizontal line that intersects both planes. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at lines in space. So what I have here is another situation where we have planes intersecting, except now on the plane of interest we have a line that is particularly interesting to us. In geology, this line can be several things. It could be a slicken line, it could be a vein, it could be a particular scratch on a rock, which could be interesting, or there's several other things that this particular line could be. And recognizing the direction and the orientation of this line in space is absolutely crucial to several geologic implications. So first and foremost, let's try and figure out what this picture is actually doing. Imagine that we have this box here, right? We've got a box that's got a plane that goes through it. This blue, these blue lines represent that plane. The top edge of this box right here is horizontal, as is the bottom edge. The plane goes diagonally through this box, and it's got this line right here at the intersection, uh, or at the crossroads of this orange and blue line right there. That's the line of interest to us. In order to classify this line, we use two different uh, terms. We use the trend and we use the plunge. The trend of the line is going to be the projection of this line onto the horizontal plane, in this case the top edge of the box. So imagine that we're looking at this box from above, all right? And whenever we're looking at this box from above, we see this line on the plane. And we can only see the trend of the line. We can't see how far it actually dips downward because we're looking at it directly from above. The direction that we see is the trend. And in this case, the trend is going at approximately 200 degrees if we maintain this sort of uh, north or this sort of compass. So 200 degrees, that's just a little bit west of south, all right? And then the plunge itself is going to tell us how much this particular line dips from the horizontal plane. So if we are to imagine ourselves looking at this triangle from the side, this is going to be a vertical triangle which means that we are going to be able to see, if we look at it from the horizontal, we're going to be able to see the entirety of the triangle. We're not gonna be seeing it at an angle. So if we're looking at this orange triangle right here, the plunge 
is the angle from the horizontal down to the line itself. And that's going to be the amount that this thing plunges. So traditionally, geologists will list the plunge before the trend, and we will list the strike before the actual dip. So for a plane, An example of a classification, or um, an example of one sort of plane, could be 0, 4, 0, 30 degrees. And what this would indicate is that this is the strike, and this is the dip. And this would be all the information that we need in order to actually classify a particular plane like this. Note that I just say the dip here. This is technically the dip angle, how much the plane actually dips below the horizontal. Again, the di dip direction is inferred. For a line, most geologists have the convention of listing the plunge before the trend. And so this is a little backwards, but what we would say is 30 degrees, 200 for this line listed here. And so this is going to be the plunge, and this will be the trend. Another important component whenever we're evaluating lines in space is that of the pitch or the rake of the line. So imagine we have the same scenario down here as we did up above. I've just gotten rid of the orange up here. Imagine that we have this line that is on a plane and we want to know its pitch. The pitch of the line is the angle within the plane between a horizontal line and the um, line of interest itself. In this case, it would be this. It would be right here. This is the pitch or the rake of the line. So that's all I've got for you guys right now. Next episode, we'll be looking at the attitude of lines and planes and trying to find their true strike and dip if we're looking at it from an odd view. Thanks.